the integral from 0 to pi over 2 secant theta d theta. What makes an integral an improper integral? Uh, um, secant of 0 is 1 time. Secant of 0 is 1. Secant of pi over 2 is undefined? Secant of 0 is... Yeah, because secant is 1 over cosine. Yeah. Cosine of 0 is 1, so 1 over 1. Secant of pi over 2, however, is undefined because you would have 1 over cosine. Cosine of pi over 2 is 0, so you'd have 0 on 1. All right, so the pi over 2 is the problem, which means I need to write the limit as b goes to pi over 2 from the left. 0 to b of secant theta d theta. That's going to be the limit as b goes to pi over 2 from the left. What's the antiderivative of secant theta? That's the derivative of secant theta. Very good. Very good from zero to b. So I need to take the limit as b goes to pi over two from the left of ln of secant b plus tangent b minus ln of, I plug in zero. When I plug in zero, what's the secant of zero? What's the tangent of zero? One plus zero is one. That's ln of one, which happens to be zero. All right, so now the big question is, what's the limit as b goes to pi over two of the ln of secant b plus tangent b. Getting close to pi over 2. Can I just plug pi over 2 in? No. No, why not? We already said that secant of pi over 2 is undefined. Tangent of pi over 2 is also undefined. I can't plug pi over 2 in either of those functions. But we're getting really close to pi over 2. We're not exactly equal to pi over 2. I would have to say you use a calculator I would say use your vast knowledge of calculus rather than use a calculator. How about if I were to write this as the limit as b goes to pi over 2 of ln of 1 plus sine b over cosine b. And then this minus ln 1, ln 1 is 0. How did I get 1 plus sine b over cosine b? The denominator is the same. This is sine over cosine. That's, I'm sorry, that's 1 over cosine. This one's sine over cosine, so they have a common denominator. Now what? Now, when b gets close to pi over 2, so you get 1 over 1, which is the natural law, 1, which is 0. No, I got a problem here. What happens when b gets close to pi over 2? Sine of pi over 2 gets close to 1. So this is getting too close to 1 plus 1, which is 2. And this one's getting close to 0. Something getting close to 2 divided by something getting close to 0 is? You were right the first time, infinity. It's infinity, correct? Because this is getting close to 2. Because uh, 
B is smaller than pi over 2, these cosine values are all positive. So this is getting 2 over 0, but things are all positive. So this is getting close to infinity. The ln of infinity is infinity. So our answer would be that integral does not converge. Or we would say it is infinity, but it's not a number. Yeah. Some people accept the answer is infinity. Other people would just say the integral does not converge. I'll accept either one. I don't care how you say it. Questions on that? All right, now I think the last thing we need to do with improper integrals, the thing we haven't done yet, what if I gave you the integral from negative 2 to 2 of 1 over x squared dx? Why is that an improper integral? Because it has 0 in the middle, and 0 is a point of discontinuity. So a lot of people would be very tempted to do this. And I'm going to tell you this is the wrong answer. It's very easy to forget that you've got a problem here. And a lot of people would just say, well, I take the antiderivative. What's the antiderivative of 1 over x squared? Um, Think of that as x to the negative 2. Yes. Uh, negative x to the negative 1. You add 1 to your power. Think of that as being x to the negative 2. Add 1 to your power. That's negative 1. And then you plug your numbers in. So when I plug in 2, I get negative 1 half. Minus, when I plug in negative 2, I get negative 1 half. I get the answer 0. Very tempting to do. Also very easy to do. It's very easy to, to forget that this is really an improper integral. It's improper because zero's in the middle. What you really need to do is you need to take this integral and split it into two integrals. You split it, the integral from negative two to zero plus the integral from zero to two. And then what has to happen in order for this integral that we started with to exist? Both of these integrals need to exist. If one of these is infinity, then the whole answer we're going to say, or we'll say does not exist. We'll say the integral does not converge. So if one or both of these are infinity, our answer is just we can't do it. does not exist. All right, so... Let's start with, which one do you want to do first? Negative 2 to 0. Negative 2 to 0. So the integral from negative 2 to 0, we would have to write that as the limit. What's my limit going to be? A goes to 0 or B goes to 0? B, because it's up on top. B goes to 0 from the left. Why zero from the left? Because we're in between negative two and zero, so we're using numbers smaller than zero of the integral of one over x squared dx. And our integral goes from negative two to b. So that's going to be the limit as b goes to zero from the left. Negative one x to the negative one evaluated at negative 2 and b, which is the limit as x goes to, as a, b, what letter? b goes to 0 from the left of negative 1 over b minus negative 1 over negative 2. And what happens when b gets close to 0? It goes to... How about positive infinity? 
but we're going from the left. So we're slightly smaller than zero. So we've got negative one on top. We've got numbers really, really close to zero on bottom, but they are negative because we're approaching zero from the left. So that integral diverges. That one's infinity. So what would we say about the whole original problem? It does not exist. We would say it diverges. Do we even have to check the second integral? No. Once we get one of them fails, the whole thing fails. The other one would cut about to be infinity or negative infinity also. And the other one would also diverge. And that's typically going to happen. It, it's pretty rare that one, one will converge and one will diverge. I suppose there are examples like that. I can't think of one off the top of my head, but I suppose that can happen. So if we get a real answer for both of them? If you get a real answer for both of them, then your answer is just add those two real answers together. Okay. Questions on that? I don't know. Let's find out. If we plug that integral into our calculator, what will happen? So I go to math, integral, negative 2 to 2, 1 over x squared dx. Now again, notice my calculator has a new operating system, so typing that in is very nice. It looks just like it looks. Not so nice if you have the older operating system. Anybody have one with an older operating system? I can show you how to type that in. Divide by zero. The calculator says, no good. You can't do it. So that would lead me to believe the answer is does not exist. You don't need to. You don't get a lot of points when you don't show work on your tests. Let me borrow yours. Yeah. Alright, so on the older, if you have an older TI-84 if you, or if you have a TI-83, it's going to look like this. You're going to hit this math button over here on the left hand side. Yeah, That's right. Uh, F-N-I-N-T, function integral. F-N-I-N-T. There should be a little N there. If you don't have an end, don't worry about it. Just use it. See if it works. All right, then what you have to do is you have to type in your function, 1 divided by x squared, and then you got to put a comma and an x. So that's like your dx. That's the symbol the calculator used for dx. Comma, then your smaller number, comma, and then your bigger number. So negative 2 to 2. Another way to do it, so it still says I can't do it, which is good. Here says argument. Then you forgot some, you forgot one of the things to put on there. One over x squared, comma x, comma negative two, comma zero, or comma two. And your other option, Colin is correct, the other option is you can go 1 divided by x squared and draw the graph. And then under calculate, which is up here on trace, so I can calculate the integral and tell it lower bound, negative 2, upper bound 2, and once again the calculator says I can't do it. That's a good way to check. Excellent way to check your answer, that's correct. Oh, my Calc 1 class knew. Okay, well, yes and no. And what I mean by that is 
this TI-83 or TI-84? If I give it the, there's no way for the TI-83 or the TI-84 to do that. It will not tell me the answer is one third X cubed plus C. If I put bounds on there, it will give you the numeric value. The 89, the 89 has a computer algebra system built in, so the 89 would give you the antiderivative of x squared dx. I have the 89 and I have no idea. The TI-92 will also do it. Yeah, the TI-89's have got a lot of stuff on it. Yep. You might notice when you were in there, for those of you who didn't know, calculator also does derivatives. But again, it only does the derivative at a value. So it won't tell you the derivative of sine is cosine. But it will tell you, for example, if I say I want derivative with respect to x of sine x at pi over 4, it will tell me the answer is 0 0.01745. So, so, so you, again, your calculator can give you numeric values. Um, although that one's not right. Because the derivative of sine should be cosine. That should be cosine at pi over 4. And the cosine of pi over 4 is... Pi over 4 is 45 degrees. That's true. Cosine of 45 degrees is... Square root of 2 over 2. Point zero one seven is definitely not square root of 2 over 2. I am in degrees mode, I bet. Calculator's never wrong, you just tell it the wrong things. Yeah, I'm in degrees mode. 0.707, that's better. That's about the square root of 2 over 2. So, calculator will do derivatives also. Again, numeric values. It will not take the derivative of sine x and tell you the answer is cosine x. TI-89 will do that. As will the TI-92 and the TI-Inspire with the CAS option. TI-Inspire comes in two different versions. There's CAS and non-CAS. CAS stands for Computer Algebra System. <laughs> yeah, the Inspire is um, probably a third bigger than this thing is. It's a large thing. So will the Wolfram Alpha app on your cell phone. It will also take derivatives and integrals for you. And it's free. And it's free. The app will give you step-by-step solutions. The website used to give you two a day, but now it won't That is correct. The website used to give you, actually it used to give you unlimited step-by-steps. And then they changed it to three a day if you created an account or logged in through Facebook. And then they... Killed it all. Then they went to two show me steps a day, and then they killed it all together unless you pay for your subscription. But if you get the app, then it will give you the step by step. I could pay for that app, though. You do have to pay for the app. Yeah. But it's, worth, it's not a subscription. It's, it's, it's not a subscription. You pay once and you never pay again. And if you get lucky, you get it on sale. I paid $1.99 for it when I bought it. I got lucky. It was on sale one day and I bought it. So. <laughs> nice little laugh. Other questions, comments, concerns? That's a wrap for chapter 8. You're almost correct. That's the end of chapter 8. What happens when we get to the end of chapter 8? We go ahead and Correct. We do have a test on Tuesday. Uh, I passed out a review sheet last time. Thirty, I think there were thirty exciting questions. Uh, I wouldn't. You would know. 
Uh, I don't have one with me, so I guess I can't. Oh, yeah. oh I've got one. You look at it over the weekend, and you come to class on Monday with questions, and we'll look at a few of them. All right, so today we start chapter 9. Section 9.1 is about sequences. What's a sequence? No, these those are sequins, not sequences. <laughs> What's a sequence? Give me an example of a sequence. One, two, three, four, five, six. That's a pretty boring one, but that is a good example of a sequence. One, one, two, three, five, eight. That's the Fibonacci sequence. That's another good example of a sequence. So what's a sequence? Normally there's a pattern, and the sequences we're going to look at are going to have patterns, but there doesn't have to be a pattern. Okay. Well, the math definition is a sequence is a function The domain is all positive integers. So example, I might give you a function. I might tell you the function is f of x equals 1 over x. So that doesn't look like a sequence. But if I tell you the domain is only positive integers, then what am I telling you about numbers you can plug in for x? All positive numbers? No, not all positive numbers. And what are the positive integers? 1, 2, 3, 4. Those are the only numbers you can plug in. You can't plug in a half, you can't plug in pi, so on and so forth. So we could start writing down f of 1 is 1, and f of 2 is a half, and so on and so forth. f of 3 would be a third, f of 4 would be a fourth, and so on and so forth. So that would be a sequence. Now, traditionally, when we write sequences, we don't write them with function notation. The traditional way you would see this, this sequence written, this function written, we would typically more write it that way. a sub n equals 1 over n. What does that mean? What's this a sub n thing? Yeah, it means we're calling the sequence a, just like we called this function f. And it's dependent on n, just like we had f parenthesis x means our function name is f, and its input is x. This one means our sequence name is a, and our inputs are n's, where n stands for integers. So again, we would have a sub 1 is 1, a sub 2 is a half, a sub 3 is a third, so on and so forth. Okay? So that's the notation we're, we tend to use for sequences. We tend to use a sub n or b sub n, so on and so forth. We don't tend to use f of x. We say that a sequence converges if the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n is some number l. Otherwise, infinity, a sub n does not converge.
So I might ask you, does a sub n equal 1 over n converge? <coughs> Your answer is going to be yes or no. And if the answer is yes, you're going to tell me what it converges to. Does it converge? No? Why not? Yes? Change your mind? Yeah. Well, all I'm really asking you is, what's the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over n? zero. You divide by a bigger and bigger number, you get zero. So does it converge? It has to. Yes, in fact it converges to? Yeah. Yes. So that sequence, a sub n equals 1 over n converges, yes. That's just an example of one sequence, that's not necessarily all sequences. For example, I might give you, does b sub n equal negative 1 to the n converge? So that's a different sequence. Correct. If I take the limit as n goes to infinity of minus 1 to the n, is that limit getting close to a number? No, because if n is odd, negative 1 to the n is going to be negative 1. But if n is even, it's going to be 1. So this, this is, this is an, what we would call an alternating sequence. The sequence is negative 1, positive 1, negative 1, positive 1, negative 1, positive 1, negative 1, positive 1. When n gets bigger and bigger and bigger, is that getting close to a number? No, it's bouncing back and forth between two numbers. So you wouldn't want to say infinity, you just say it does not. Correct, it's not infinity, is it? It's not infinity. So we would just say the limit as n goes to infinity of minus 1 to the n does not exist. So the final answer is, does this sequence converge? No. Does C sub n equal 1 to the n converge? What's the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 to the n? 1? All right, so in a couple sections ago, when we were doing L'Hopital's rule, didn't we say 1 to the infinity is an indeterminate form? Yes, but what do we mean when we say 1 to the infinity is an indeterminate form? We did not mean that this base was exactly 1. We meant this base was getting really, really, really close to 1. In this case, we have exactly 1. 1 squared is, 1 cubed is, 1 to the 10 billion is, 1 to any big number you can think of is, 1, so this limit is, 1, so does this converge? Yes. So you've got to be very careful when you talk about 1 to the infinity. In this case, I mean exactly the number 1 to any power, that's always going to be 1. What we were looking at before might have been something like. Yeah, we didn't want to worry about being close to one. Does d sub n equal 1 plus 1 over n to the n converge? So now we're in a slightly different situation. Now I have to limit as n goes to infinity of 1 plus 1 over n to the n. This one is indeterminate, I agree. 
This one's in the form 1 to the infinity, but this is not exactly the number 1 inside here. It gets really, really, really close to 1. Converge, yes or no? I see some no's, I see some yeses. Some of you are right and some of you are wrong. What did we do when we had a limit that was in the form one to the infinity? Or zero to the zero, we did the same thing for both of them. We did what? We manipulated them how? We called them y. And then we did ln, and why did we do ln? Brought the power down. So ln y is limit as n goes to infinity of n, ln 1 plus 1 over n. Then we noticed we were in the form infinity times 0, because this one's getting really close to ln 1. And all I want is zero. So we were in the form infinity times zero. What did we do when we had infinity times zero? Put one, Put one of them on the bottom. Which one's easier to move? The n. So we wrote this as the limit as n goes to infinity of ln of 1 plus 1 over n divided by n to the negative 1. And then we're in the form 0 over 0. So then we can go visit L'Hopital. That's the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over 1 plus 1 over n. And then i got to take the derivative of that thing. What's the derivative of 1 plus 1 over n? How about negative 1 n to the negative 2? Because I think of this as being n to the negative 1. So I bring 1 down and I subtract 1. And then on bottom, the derivative is negative 1 and to the negative 2. That's very convenient because those cancel out. Now, as n goes to infinity, I get 1. So I have ln of y equals 1, which tells me y is e to the 1, which is e. So does my original sequence d sub n converge, yes or no? Yes, in fact, it converges to E. So if we have what we tell you and stuff, how hard is it to make a sequence that doesn't converge? How hard, does it make the sequ to, how hard is it to make a sequence that doesn't converge? Well, I already made one, right? Uh, oh, you can't see that. I made one that doesn't converge. I'll make another one. Uh, I have a question on that. Go ahead. How do um, 1 plus 1 over n, so you're saying that's getting closer to 0? 1 plus 1 over n, when n gets really big, that gets close to 1 plus 0, which is 1. Yeah. But ln of 1 happens to be 0. zero. So it's not, 1 plus 1 over n itself is getting close to 1, but then when I whack it with an ln, that's getting close to 0. So how do you get the answer of 1? Well, now when I took the derivative, when I take the derivative of an ln thing, the ln goes away, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So it's 1 over whatever's inside the ln yeah. times the derivative of whatever was inside. So there's no more ln. So now I just get 1, but I don't have an ln anymore, so it is just really 1. Yeah. All right, so how hard is it to make examples? Uh oh, not paper. How hard is it to make examples of sequences that don't converge? Not very hard at all. How about, I'll go back to A because I forgot what letter I was on. A sub n equals. Anybody have an idea of a sequence that won't converge? What's that? N. Because the limit as n goes to infinity of n is going to be infinity. So does that one converge? By the same token, I could do n squared, I could do n cubed, I could do n to the fourth, I could keep going forever there, couldn't I? All right, those are kind of boring. 
and I could do square roots and cube roots and fourth roots and fifth roots, and I'd still get infinity for all of those. All right, so can you come up with one that's a little bit more interesting than just n to a power? It's a good answer. How about b sub n equals 4 to the n over n to the 8th? I will. Good idea. My next one will have trigs in it. Absolutely, we can have trigs in them. But but remember, the rule is the inputs are integers. The outputs can be ugly numbers. Correct, because a, for example, to sign a four, not a nice number. Sine of five, sine of six, sine of seven. None of them are nice numbers, yeah, are they? We're still dealing with gradients. Correct. How are they ever getting this? Converge or diverge? What's that? Diverge. Why do you say diverge? Well, when I'm talking about a sequence, when I'm talking about a sequence, I'm always talking about the limit as n goes to infinity. And I agree with you completely, that's in the form infinity over infinity. But infinity over infinity is indeterminate. It might be infinity, it might be zero, it might be any number in between. So from the form infinity over infinity, what do we do? We go visit our friend Lopi Tau. That's the limit as n goes to infinity. I'll take the derivative of the bottom, 8n to the 7. What's the derivative of 4 to the n? It's got a log in it. Yes, it does. ln of 4 times 4 to the n. Well, I multiplied by an ln 4. But it's still have 4 to the n. And I can't get rid of that 4 to the n. If I do L'Hopital's rule again, is that 4 to the n ever going to go away? But the bottom eventually will, won't it? So eventually, when I keep taking the derivatives, eventually what am I going to get on bottom? A really big number. A constant. What constant? It's pretty big, I agree. 8 times 7 times 6 times 5, give me a name for that. 8 factorial. So if I, if I take the derivative 7 more times, eventually this is going to be the limit as n goes to infinity. Eventually I'm going to get a number on bottom. I'll get 8 factorial. And I'll end up with ln of 4 to the 8th, 4 to the n. Because each time I take the derivative, I'm going to get another ln 4. So eventually I get just a fixed number on bottom and I get infinity on top. So this one is infinity. So this one is again divergent. So, so there's a good example of using L'Hopital's rule. So when it goes to infinity, it's diverging? Correct. So if it goes to infinity, or if it does the thing where it bounces back and forth, like the other one we had. Either one of those cases we say is divergent. And if it goes to a number, then? If it goes to a number, then it converges, and it converges to that number, yeah. whatever that number might be. Yeah. Correct. Sequences can converge to any number. Yes. Would you like a sequence that converges to pi? C sub n equals pi. <laughs> What's the limit as n goes to infinity? Pi. There's a sequence that converges to pi. Thought I was going to make a fancy one, didn't you? <laughs> You're not impressed?
<laughs> How simple and quick that was? All right, trick functions. D sub n equals the cosine of 1 over n. Converge or diverge? Converges to 1. Because the limit, as n goes to infinity, of cosine of 1 over n, that's getting close to cosine of 0. Cosine of 0 is 1. Convergent to 1. What if I give you e sub n is cosine n? Converge or diverge? What do you mean it continues to go up? Correct. Because now when n goes to infinity, it just continues to spin around and around the clock. Correct. You continue, you're getting your, I, I would think of it as a cosine wave if you think of your graph. As n keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger, you're not getting the whole wave, you're just getting distinct points. But as n gets bigger and bigger and bigger, that's just going to keep going through the cosine wave over and over and over again, is it? Yes. Is it going to get close to a number? No. So that's another one, that, an example that's divergent, but it's not going to infinity, it's not going to negative infinity. So what would you say is going to? not going to anything, it's divergent. So like if you were, if you took one and I don't know what you're going to do, you're going to add, just by divergent. I would say that limit does not exist, in which case the sequence is therefore divergent. Not for this one, because this one does not equal infinity, does it? In fact, cosine is stuck between negative 1 and positive 1, so it's definitely not getting close to infinity. So this limit, you cannot say that this limit is infinity. Well, x is going to infinity, but when we're talking about limits, we're asking what's the y value doing. So again, a cosine wave looks something like this. So the y values, like cosine of 1 might be here, cosine of 2, cosine of 3, cosine of 4, cosine of 5, so on and so forth. You're just getting distinct points. And actually, what you keep it the same. Eventually, Even if you do start getting the same y values over again, they're still... It doesn't, it doesn't convert them. It doesn't get close to a single number, does it? They still keep bouncing up and down between negative 1 and positive 1. Yeah. Infinite loop does not exist. All right, so we will talk a little bit more about sequences on Monday.